Listen, everybody, we all know that real estate is the most proven way to build wealth. But why isn't everyone wealthy from real estate then? It's hard to know where to start, and most of the education out there is just complete trash, and you end up investing your money on a series of courses instead of in real estate. That's not how this podcast works. We give you the blueprint to successful real estate investing and bring on guests actually willing to share their secrets. I started my real estate investing journey as a freshman in college when I bought my first duplex and have been in the trenches doing deals ever since. And today, I now own hundreds of millions of dollars of investment property. On this podcast, you will learn what you actually need to know to be a successful active or passive real estate investor. And we'll offer our takes on what's happening today so you can navigate this market and build wealth. I'm Drew Brenneman, and this is the Brenneman Blueprint. All right, welcome back to another episode. We got Matt Four on the podcast today with Next Level Income. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for having me, Drew. Yeah, excited for today's episode. And, uh, you know, so Matt invests in some interesting niche asset classes like car washes, mobile home, home parks, and real estate debt. So interested in talking about all that stuff today. Haven't had anyone... Um, haven't almost met anyone who's invested in all those. So, uh, and actually went to a car wash this morning and was, was thinking about you cause I paid, uh, I think $20 to wash the outside and then 17 to do the, or 15 to do the inside. So I was like, wow, this is, this is a good, uh, good upsell system where, you know, I go you're, in there thinking I'm you're getting ripped off. You got to call your boy next time. Yeah, no, I, I, ba- yeah, that one, I, at least I knew I was getting ripped off whereas it's the closest one to my house and I'm like, I'm just gonna, I, I, you know, I got to factor in my time too on this, uh, some of these choices. So yeah, but yeah they, of course you could get a subscription, uh, and save, but I know how often I was getting my car washed. So I, I don't think I would have made out on that, but yeah, so let's, yeah, happy to dive into all that. But yeah, really, I think probably want to hear, you know, why, why did you start investing in real estate? I think that would be an interesting place to start. Yeah, sure. So uh, my journey to real estate is actually through technology sales. So I spent 15 years of my career in technology sales and sales leadership at some of the largest companies in the world. And in 2016, I landed a humongous deal. And it's the deal like all salespeople wish. It was a net new logo as a huge rip out of a competitor of ours. And it was a $10 million deal. And I remember at the time seeing the commission check that I was going to get and started calculating, like, what should I do with this money? I grew up in like rural East Tennessee, so I was never big into houses, cars, watches, boats, all those sorts of things. So I was looking at different ways to invest it. Looked at crypto, look at annuities, bonds, stocks. And I had a mentor at the time that was like, hey, you should look at this real estate thing. Cash flows, it appreciates, gives you some tax benefits. And then I got the call the week of Christmas from my VP at the time that said, hey, I'm not going to get that commission check. I'm only going to get two cents on the dollar. And I remember being super frustrated, and super angry and just asking, like, how did we get to this number? And he said, Matt, how much money have you made this year? And when I told him, he goes, well, isn't that enough? So it is at that point that I realized, hey, if I'm going to achieve the goals that I have in life, if I'm going to give back to the causes I care about, pursue the passions I care about, be intentional with those that I love, I was going to have to figure out a different way. And so fortunately, I had my mentor at the time who was talking all this real estate nonsense to me. I read the purple book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, went on bigger pockets, all that sort of stuff, and bought my first uh, townhome very shortly after that. And so kind of started in the townhome space, did a couple flips, a couple burrs, and then ultimately started getting involved in the commercial space. So that's ultimately what brought me here here to to the real estate journey. That's wild. And so two cents on the dollar as in uh, your commission was two cents on the sale or it was no two cents on what you would have normally got or I don't even two cents on what I normally would have got. And I I never disclosed the money publicly. I will say it is still a a good chunk of change, right? I grew up in in a very poor environment where that was a lot of people's salaries for the year. So I don't want to demean and say that it wasn't a lot of money, but at the same time, you get involved in sales because you want to give the yourself the ability to get a raise whenever you want by selling more and getting creative and finding deals and work and things like that. And so when I got that news, I was just disheartened that, hey, why am I working this hard if you can just rip away our contract and our payment agreements at any point? Right. Or why? Yeah. Why even be in sales if uh, it's yeah, there's then they're just going to start somehow capping you out with no explanation. Yeah. Exactly. That's- Yeah, that's wild. And then I I remember you had told me that from basically when you started to uh, three years, you were 
financially free? I mean, how, how did you do it so quickly? Cause I, I think I, you know, my story, it, I, it, I built up over, you know, almost like a decade kind of like a slower, but yeah. How did, how did you do that? Yeah. A couple of quick things. I mean, when I say financially free, I wasn't flying first class air Dubai to Europe or anything like that. It just basically meant that I could have a roof over my head and food on the table. And ultimately I was able to achieve that with a couple of things. One, I was single at the time, single, no kids living a low cost lifestyle. I mean, my mortgage payment at the time was $670, right? So it was super cheap living at that time. Um, and two, I was very fortunate in the fact that in a sales role, you do get these lumpy commission checks. So you're always having this windfall of like, what, what should you be doing with this capital? Uh, but last, and I think the most important is I learned how to recycle capital. I think like a lot of people who get involved in real estate or just middle America, bury your money in a 401k and hope when you want it, it's more money later. They, they aren't taught the skills of learning how to refinance out money, um, take loans against assets that you have and just have your dollar working in multiple different places. So it's when I finally learned that skill that I was able to go out there and start really accelerating my wealth journey. That's interesting. And so when for multiplying your your dollar, were these were deals you had then you were you'd invest and then it were they were shorter holds or what do you what do you mean by that more specifically? It was a lot of burrs at the time. So a burr, just if, in case that's a new term for anybody, it's where you buy a value add property, you add the value to it, you increase the value, you go rent it out, put a tenant in there, then you take out the initial equity through a refinance and go redeploy that capital somewhere else. So after doing that three or four times with multifamily like triplexes and duplexes, quickly you can scale into uh, a cash flow that's meaningful. And at what point did you then make this transition to uh, to car washes, mobile home parks, real estate debt? Yeah, it was before the pandemic. I had two things that really kind of happened in my career. Well, three. One, I got a new role in my career. So I was moving, I was accelerating, I was growing in, in my W-2. So I knew that I wanted to get more passive. But also, I had 10 single families in my portfolio at that time. And I had reached this point of where Fannie and Freddie wouldn't lend me any more money. And fortunately or unfortunately, I had an HVAC go out on one unit and a, a minor flood on another. So I was starting to see like, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't scale and I am having the same kind of problem with lumpy commission checks with lumpy rental income. One month rent's great and you're receiving a couple thousand dollars. The next month, that thousand, couple thousand dollars goes to replace an HVAC, which I heard this early on in my career, like water heaters and HVACs don't discriminate on the type of unit, whether it's a million dollar property or a $20,000 property an HVAC costs about the same. So you might as well work upstream where you can get more revenue from those properties. Um, so it was at that point where, you know, I started investing passively with different operators that I knew out there before kind of diving in and get back on the active side. Did you look at any point just more st stepping into larger multifamily deals instead of from a three unit going to like a 10 unit or did you, why didn't you go that route? I'd be, be curious since that's the route I went. So I kind of wish I would have gone that route. Um, the largest multifamily I ever owned was triplex. So it's not like I had quads or, you know, 10 unit buildings and things like that. I definitely thought about it. But at that time, I also was taking a new role, I was moving and I was going to have additional responsibility. And it just it felt like a bigger burden for me to go set up commercial lines of credit, commercial loans, all those sorts of things. Looking back on it, I probably should have gone down that path um, for reasons that we've talked about a little bit offline. Um, and I'm happy to discuss here. But uh, yeah, it was just easier for me to say, okay, let me find some good operators, place some capital with them, learn a little bit more about how they operate these big properties and see if that's something I want to do before kind of delving directly into the larger commercial stuff. Right. And I think, I mean, too, you're factoring in your, your time on this and you're still working at W2 at that point. So it, would, it wouldn't be that easy to just be like, okay, I'm just going to be accumulating, you know, 30 unit properties here one after another while you're also working. So, I mean, that, that, you know, to makes total sense to me why you did what you did. And then, um, cause yeah, that would have been, a, uh, it's a lot more work having, having, you know, more units. It's simple. So, so that, yeah, that makes sense. And then, so I guess maybe diving into the, um, to the mobile home parks, what, what do you like about them? What drew you to mobile home park investing? Yeah. So when I look at our portfolio and my portfolio specifically, we have a lot of apartment doors. Um, so we've, we've gone down that route. We, we believe it's a safe, stable asset class. I mean, we have 4,000 doors today, so it's not something we're against. 
but most of our apartment complexes are in that A class, upper B class. Um, the reason being is just we saw cap rates suppressing in 2019, and while they suppressed in Class A, they weren't suppressing near to the level that they were in in C class and traditional value adds. However, if you look at what's happened over the past three years, we believe in the trajectory in the next three to four, we believe more people will be moving downstream in towards of affordability. And at the end of the day, they're not really building mobile home parks anymore. In the mobile home park space, they built a ton of them in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And outside of Texas, uh, Michigan, and Florida, they're not really building mobile home park spaces anymore. And we could talk through reasons why but so if you look at it more demand shifting downstream supply is shrinking in mobile home parks there's just simple supply and demand economics where if we can go in we can revitalize some of these communities make them safe for their residents make them affordable for their residents and have quality parks then our price value should appreciate over time it's almost like there's a dwindling supply of them actually there is uh, on LinkedIn, I saw an article, um, I'm sure it was by one of the mobile home park guys I follow, but where they shared where it was, there was one in Miami that's closing and it was where, um, you know, the people were in an in, in uproar, basically like, where are they going to go? There's nowhere to live in my, in the Miami area at this kind of price. And so, um, yeah, that's, so I, I, I believe it where, yeah, no, everyone wants more affordable housing, but not anywhere, you know near them basically so that's yeah a common common thing that i hear and in uh experience a little bit when i worked at a affordable developer but then what do you where do you find your deals then uh just through broker connections i mean we've been doing this now for uh four years by the time this airs so we've got different broker connections and put ourselves out there as people that are investors in this space so through that i mean I honestly, Drew, one time I was on a podcast and somebody said, hey, I heard you had a mobile home park guy. Would you be interested in it? Never in the history of doing deals has that worked out. And he sent me 120 pads and we're like, we're we're deep into due diligence on that one right now. So we might actually acquire that guy in uh, at the beginning of the year. So it's just getting yourself out there, letting people know what what assets you're looking for, and then ultimately making sure you're aggressive and trying to find deals. And, and he was the host of that podcast or where did the deal? He listened to the podcast. He was oh, like, I had no idea okay. you guys do mobile homes. And I uh, heard you had Drew on talking about mobile homes. And uh, would you be interested in this part? Got it. Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's great. Uh, that's a, yeah, that's a good way to get uh, to generate off market deal flow for sure. But yeah, mostly yeah. mostly then brokered. I guess what do you look for in an investment then? Yeah. So in the mobile home park space, our thesis is that the 200 pads and up space is pretty much dominated by institutional capital at this point. I know Sam Zell was a big in investor in that space. Warren Buffett owns Clayton Homes, which is a home manufacturer home provider. So most of that space is pretty institutionalized now. What's not institutionalized is really that 70 to 120 pad space. It's hard to squeeze in a property manager on that amount of units or that amount of lots in a park, unless it's someone already local or lives in the park that you're giving a discount to or something like that. So really our buy boxes, we wanna be in major metropolitan areas of 100,000 plus. If it's going to be a smaller community near that 100,000 uh, person city, then we wanna have at least 30,000 people living there. And then we're looking for 50 pads to 150 pads. Because at 50 pads, what we want to do is go in and try to acquire another adjacent near property that has 50, 60, 70 lots on it that we can combine and through the radius effect, get enough lots to support a local property manager, handyman, maintenance, et cetera. Two markets we're looking at. We love the Southeast for all the, the right reasons. A lot of people moving here, supply shortage. My partner and I live in the Southeast. Why go operate in other people's territory if we don't have to? And then Midwest. Um, so we're acquiring our first Midwestern property in Kansas at the end of October. We have another one under contract that should go under contract at, actually by the end of the by the time this airs. Um, so we're we like the good steady up into the right three percent a year Midwest uh, dynamics that that brings. Yeah, and are you guys looking for a certain number of uh, park owned homes or you know what what how do you work that? Because maybe explain what I'm if you could what I'm asking if for people who aren't familiar with mobile home. Sure. So there are four different ways that you really make money on mobile home parks. One is by lot rent. Lot rent means you're going to park your home and hook it up to our utilities on my dirt. 
And for that, I'm going to charge you uh, rent to have your home on my dirt. The second way is through park owned homes that you rent back to the tenants. To me, that is the worst position. You, you don't want to own those longer term. So you're going to pay me lot rent, then you're going to pay me to rent the home. Unfortunately, though, manufactured homes, especially in this type of demographic, especially at this price point, they're not really going to appreciate the asset like like we would want them to. And like I mentioned earlier, a toilet costs the same if I'm putting it in a million dollar home or if I'm putting it at a two hundred and fifty dollar rent home. So damage can really turn over to turn your P&L upside down pretty quickly. When we're renting homes, park owned homes to our tenants, we try to sell them to them as quickly as possible. So that's the third way. So you're paying me to rent the dirt. You're paying me to rent the home. And then if you pay me a little bit extra, you can ultimately own the home. And that's good for a lot of different reasons. One, if a tenant is buying their home, one, they're going to treat the asset a lot better. And ultimately, the expenses that are occurred from that asset, whether it's a broken window, broken heater, things like that, are now on the tenant responsibility to go fix, which helps free up our expense line. The second and most important reason, too, is... Generally, we find that when we're flipping these homes from park-owned homes to tenant-owned homes, that they tend to treat the community a little bit better. They're not going to let Billy Bob down the street come in and do different things that are disruptive to the property because they own now a piece of this park or own a home in the park, and they want to make sure that it's a safe and nice environment as well. So you can make money off the dirt, you can make money off the home, you can make money off selling the home, and then last is there's an interest cost to selling the home back to the tenant, which we have our own in-house financing arm, so we'll go buy the property and mortgage it back to the tenant. So we're making money four different ways on that that type of part. And also the cap rate on the deal drops if you flip them to more uh, you know, tenant-owned homes, right? Right. Is that, uh, that's the other play. But yeah, I think, are you guys normally have to renovate the houses then too before the the homes before like a tenant would want to buy them? Um, or how, how much do you need to get into that typically? Yeah, as a general rule, yes. Um, so we do have an in-house construction team that will help us go renovate these homes. We're not looking for 100% occupied tenant-owned home parks. We're looking for a little bit of hairier deals because we do have the in-house management, the in-house construction arm to go kind of build these, the in-house financing to go sell these things back to the residents. So we are looking for hairier deals where the park that we're under contract for now 56% of it is occupied. The rest is either vacant homes that need some renovation or just vacant lots that need homes on them to sell back to tenants or to lease them out on a, a park owned rent rent basis. And so, yeah, so then the deals that you target, it's just some large element of value add, whether that's you can sell the homes back to the residents or or just, yeah, almost nearly half empty like that one. I mean, that just goes back to our general philosophy in investing is we want to find cash flow streams that we can add some sort of value to. Ultimately, everybody says they're in the value add space, but I believe value add means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. What we look for is cash flow streams that we can somehow increase revenue, decrease expenses, or manage better. We're not really interested in at this time is putting shovels in the ground just because if you have cash flow coming in, that can cause a you can you can hide a lot of bad things that happen in the day to day operations. Whereas, you know, if you're putting shovels in the ground, then you're just making a bet three years from now, I can sell this at an appreciated value. Yeah. And you have, I mean, so many more of the variables are known then in like in these, the deals you're talking about where you're acquiring existing, where you already know what your interest rate is, how much it costs to acquire the property because you're not building it and going to find out as, you know, as you go, how much under or over budget are we going to be? And yeah, you just start with a lot more knowns. So, I mean, that's like, that's a similar philosophy that I've had where we've I've only redeveloped one property otherwise it's been all all acquisitions for the same reason it's like it, it never seemed like there was enough of a, a spread uh, to have no cash flow for yeah two or three years and then have basically none of your variables known uh, at all since you got to re-rent it you got to refi there's so many things you got to do but I guess then the Midwest is that like a newer focus for you guys because I I think uh, I've been I've been hearing that more from people in other product types where you know the Sun Belt and the coasts and all this they were you know they were booming 
and uh, you know the Midwest is kind of clicks along at two three percent, and then when things are not growing, that sounds pretty good, right? So is that is that r- like a recent pivot just to the market conditions, or or how that come about? We still love the Southeast, so we're still going to invest in the Southeast. We have a Southeast bias and preference, so we will still go after Southeast markets. When you look at mobile home parks specifically, though, you need a large industrial blue collar based workforce. And I don't see a lot of that in Atlanta, in Orlando, in Tampa, in Miami. So that's another reason that's kind of pulling us to the South, uh, to the Midwest is you do find a little bit more industrial blue collar workers where the strategy fits the market and the market fits the strategy. Okay, nice. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And then you can build scale like you're talking about or acquire another park nearby. And then how are you typically financing these then? A lot of seller finance right now. So what you'll find in this space is there are a lot of mom and pops who built these things in the 70s, 80s, or have just lived off the cash flow for years. And they're ultimately looking for an exit plan and they just want continuous cash flow. So the park we have under contract right now is a five-year interest only um, loan from the seller. And then we'll ultimately get it into an agency type debt or some traditional commercial mortgage. This episode is brought to you by Brenneman Capital, the firm I started to help others invest in real estate. We invest in multifamily assets that meet our very strict criteria in locations positioned for the most growth. We use institutional quality investment models and processes and combine that with old school hustle to generate superior risk adjusted returns for our investors. Invest now or learn more at Brenneman.com. Nice. And then what's how how are you guys planning on exiting these? This is it a portfolio or what's the what's the play on exit? Yeah, it depends on the asset. It's not necessarily a portfolio. So when we talk a little bit about car washes, there is a little bit of a portfolio effect. In um, mobile home parks, it's more of the the asset itself. So it really depends on the asset. We've modeled out some three to five to seven year refinances. Can we refinance out investors and then ultimately just hold it? Or does it make sense to just have the big exit event and liquidate them? So I think ultimately it is going to be a sell onto the next buyer that is similar to the original owners just wants to live off the cash flow of them because the hard work's already been done. But that's ultimately what we're thinking there. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And is interesting where, yeah, I can see why you got into that, where it's really, it's need based and it's, a little, it's differentiated. So no, it's a great, great play. And then I, yeah, for the car washes then maybe to jump to that, I guess, what do you like about the investing in car washes? To take a step back, car washes are just cash flow machines. Um, I think I joke about it. We might be the only non NBA players that own car washes. And I say that jokingly, just in the sense of like really wealthy people who are looking for cash cow investments have stumbled upon this asset class and really kind of exposed it. Ultimately, that's kind of how we stumbled upon the space. We had some lucky interactions uh, being VIPs at some conferences where the guest speakers were talking about their car wash portfolio and our spidey senses went up around like, wait, wait a minute, there's a trend here that all these rich guys know what's going on. So a couple stats just about the car wash space is one car ownership right now in America is at its highest it's ever been. I think it's at like 94.5% or something like that. And most of those cars were purchased within the last three years. And when you think about it, a car is usually the first, if not the second most valuable asset that someone owns. And majority of those sales were done in the past three years over the COVID years. So we believe that, hey, if if you just purchased one of your largest assets that you'll ever purchase in your life in the last three years, then you're probably going to care, feed it, take good care of it for the first couple of years. The second thing that we really loved about this space is it's very fragmented. So the number one car wash provider today owns 4% of the market. Now, when I say soda, you probably think Coke or Pepsi. And when I say toothpaste, you probably think Colgate or Crest. And when I say car wash, you think of the car wash that's around your corner. There's no national brand. So our thought process is very similar to every business out there that I've seen in every industry. There's going to be a consolidation play. And our goal is to get to 100 locations by 2025. And by that time, we will be a top 12 car wash provider And we will either go try to participate in the consolidation or we will stick our hand up and receive one of the calls from one of these PE firms, sovereign wealth funds that try to consolidate this industry and be a prime acquisition target for that. 
Okay, nice. No, that's yeah, that's a great strategy. What and then same thing. How do you find the the deals? It's similar. There are there car wash brokers or where are, where do you where do you find the deals? Yeah, car washes are unique in the fact that they're real estate and their business. So, common question I get is, do we operate the car washes as well? Yes. So we own the dirt, we own the washes, we operate them as well. So we find them through commercial brokers of businesses and commercial brokers of uh, of real estate as well. Okay, nice. And the oftentimes the real estate brokers they're selling a uh, a car wash that then has closed, or it would be open and. Because I would think that it would maybe more just like a landlord, you know, or position where you're, you have a tenant in there. I guess I'm sure you, how, how, what are they normally listing? Let's say the broker. They're listing the real estate. I haven't seen a ton of, and I'm not saying they're, they're not out there, but like leased out car washes. It's usually Drew owns this car wash and he wants to sell it. Not Drew owns the piece of dirt and Matt runs the car wash and he wants to sell the piece of dirt. Um, so that's typically what we see is that they're, they're selling the whole package with it, the real estate, the okay. operations, all that. Nice. Yeah. I just want to clarify, cause I would think that would be more like in the, like a business broker world then, cause this is a lot, this is a bit more operational intense than, than like just your regular real estate deal. So, yeah. And, and that's why we love this space is because it fits into both. So we get the cash flow, the appreciation, the huge tax benefits of owning car washes, but also the ability to control our expenses at a more granular level and really pump up our EBITDA numbers and operate it like it's a business. And then what are you looking for in a car wash? Uh, like what will make something you want to invest in? What makes something you wouldn't want to invest in? There's really three different types of car washes. So first there's the self-service car wash. This is the wash your dog car wash, as I like to call it. Like you pop in two quarters, you get the aggressive spray gun and you're just trying to spray off the mud from your car or your dog got into some mud or the creek and you're just trying to rinse them off before taking them back to the house. We don't operate in that space. Um, not to say you can't be successful in that space. It's just not an area where we're focused. The other two are very similar in the fact that they both have tunnels. One is an automatic bay and one is like an M bay. So the full turnkey service where you have 30 employees, they're spits shining your tires and, and doing the full service packages and things like that. That's not really an area where we focus on either just because there's so much labor intensity around that. What we're looking for are newer built car washes like 2010 and newer, if we can find them, we'll go down to 2000 that are the express bay tunnels. So 120 to 150 feet long. And then they have some vans, uh, some vacuums there. They have some vending machines for you to get all your armor wall wipes and things like that. But ultimately, we're going to try to digitize and put as much technology around the car wash as possible to reduce our employee headcount. So we'll still have a salesperson there that's trying to sell subscriptions. We'll still have some operations people just in case something breaks or something gets uh, messed up in the system. But we're really looking for 2000 and above uh, built express bay. So 120, 150 uh, feet long. And then usually just geographic areas where we're in the path of prosperity. So we want to see 20 to 50,000 cars pass by a day, usually on the upper end of that. And usually like bigger neighborhoods or bigger businesses kind of being built around that area so that we're in that path of prosperity. And then just trying to visualize the facility. So this you... You're going through, it's your, you stay in your car, it's automated, the wash, obviously you come out. Is there somebody who, who dries off the car or that's not typically, it's just going to be, there's a little drying mechanism at the end of the washes that'll rinse off all the, not rinse off, that'll blow dry off all the water. And then you can pull your car around and do your vacuuming and all that kind of stuff yourself. Yeah. Cause that's, yeah. I've been to plenty of those and then also been to the, you know, the full, full service ones where you get out of the car, someone's vacuuming it, you walk through a thing and pay and hand them something at the end, you know, like all that you target the type you do because you can, why is that? Cause you can bring technology to make it more efficient or is there another piece of it? It's the price point of the wash or, or why do you target the type you do? Yeah. Price, a couple things, price point, um, the way we operate our washes and things like that, but also more importantly, it's just employee count, right? So when we got in this space in uh, late 2020, early 2021, that's when wage inflation was really starting to grab hold. And what we didn't want to do was build out a whole boatload of these uh, locations where you're going to have to have so many employees on site and unpredictable wage growth, essentially. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'd be curious, what's the what does the underwriting look like? Because I 
uh, I could, I guess, guess what the biggest expense is, but I'd be curious kind of what, you know, what, what does like a P and L look like on a car wash? Yeah. So you've got a couple things. One, obviously there's the tax, there's, um, employee count and chemical cost and things like that. The biggest expense is employees though. We've been able to negotiate a ton of lucrative chemical contracts. Now that we have 30 locations, we're put in the top 25, top 30 car wash providers in the country. So we've been able to negotiate some per use basis of chemicals. But ultimately, like when we're going into a, a wash, we see that people are overbuying and under diluting their chemicals. So for instance, I, I, and I'm not a chemist, right? So I'm going to be way over my ski tips on this and we can bring in an operations person to have the conversation around like, what is the right chemical mix? But we'll come in and we'll see like, Hey, they've got it 90% chemical and 10% water when really they should be running at like a 60, 40 ratio. Those ratios right there might not seem huge, but when you spread that out across a portfolio, you're talking about saving millions of dollars. I know we've talked personally in the past around just the water reclamation as well. So some cities, counties, and things like that have incentives for you to reclaim your water, reuse your water, and things like that. So what we'll do is we'll put some of that in place. Normally, car washes have something like that in place, but ultimately, we're documenting that and then going back to the city and really trying to make sure that we're accurately accounting for how much water we're rec we're, we're reclaiming and reusing um, and helping lower our water bill. What are the re returns look like? I know it's more... A lot of it, it comes from cash flow, which is great. So what, how do you look at the returns? Yeah, we typically run at like a 50 to 60% profit margin. So from that sense alone, that's a pretty darn good business. For our investors, it's definitely going to depend on kind of the fund they're in and um, the cash on cash returns and, and things like that of those particular locations. But our goal is to essentially get to around a two and a half equity multiple exit on these. Over what time period? Five years. Okay, nice. Yeah, those are high returns. Uh, if let's say someone, if you, you were to hit the two and a half equity multiple on a five year, how much could, would you say would be from cash flow? Let's say uh, a majority of it, probably two okay. two X of that. Yeah. So the okay. way we've we've kind of modeled it is that the years four and five of those were averaging right around 14 to 17 percent cash on cash in those years. And then I'd imagine, um, I mean, you can take the same, you know, tax benefits as you know, a regular real estate investing. So you're able to depreciate the property. And I would think a lot of that could be probably bonus depreciated. So is that something you guys have taken advantage of? Yeah, but I'm going to borrow from Sham Wow and say, but wait, there's more. So the cool part about the car wash industry is the fact that it is real estate, but also it is a business, right? So the tunnels that I'm mentioning are considered operating equipment and operating equipment gets depreciated on a 15 year time scale versus multifamily on a 27 and a half or office on a 39 year. When you're talking about bonus depreciation and K1 losses, you're going to get a huge tax benefit from this space, which is good because a lot of this, the, the returns in the car wash space are given in the form of cash distribution. Uh, so to have a huge K1 loss that you can use to offset that cash distribution is definitely helpful. Okay, nice. No, that's great. Yeah, I, f I figured that was the case. So just wanted to tee up Matt. So <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, and then I guess the exit plan, I think you covered that. And then how do you finance these deals? The exit plan, just to touch on it before getting into the finance is um, really the portfolio effect, right? We believe that there will be someone that comes in this industry and tries to consolidate this. It's happened across every industry, right? J and J, uh, Procter and Gamble in the computer industry, Microsoft is the only software company out there really. Like there just have been a history of these consolidation plays. Not only that, but like in the car wash business itself, we throw a subscription model on it. So we now have reoccurring revenue in our business stream, which gets valued at a higher EBITDA when you go try to trade that on Wall Street than a typical just lumpy, hey, your, your summer months are good, but your winter months don't look so great. So for that reason, those reasons alone, subscription model, reoccurring revenue, portfolio effect, we believe that if we acquire these at an 8x EBITDA, that we could go trade them at a 15 to 18x EBITDA on, on sale. To your question about financing, so we've done commercial mortgages on these, and we've also done uh, be traditional business acquisition loans. We've looked at some SBA stuff. We have not acquired anything on an SBA loan today. 
but I do know other people in the industry that have gone out and leveraged SBA loans to go acquire these as well. Okay, nice. Yeah, I think those have a pretty long closing timeline. So I think that's, you know, got to probably maybe okay in this environment, but you know, probably before, you know, that's not going to fly. So a little disadvantage. Yep. Yeah. Well, nice. And then on the real estate debt side, I think, why don't we just touch on that quick? I mean, how do you do it? What do you like about it? Yeah, I, um, so I love math. And one thing that I love about real estate is it's really, you have three variables. As long as you have two, you can figure out the other variable. So everything from how much money do you want to make to what interest rate do you want to charge to what's your original principal, as long as you know two of those, you can get the other one. So our real estate fund, our real estate debt fund is really just lending out to fix and flippers. So I think you're pretty well aware to this, but people that go and buy fix and flips that you see on HGTV, they don't buy things in cash. They buy things with other people's cash that they borrow at a higher leverage point. So it's short-term loans. We're lending these out on six-month basis. If somebody wants to extend that loan, we'll charge a few points of upfront capital to extend the loan. But ultimately, we're able to just kind of continually de-risk ourselves because we're on short-term note basis. And it's been a great income stream for my personal portfolio. It's where I park some cash, get some income. And then when it's time to go invest in another deal, pull that cash out of the fund and go invest in something else. And these are first mortgage positions then? Yeah, they're first mortgage liens traditionally to properties that banks won't lend on. Uh, so the fix and flips. Um, we do have in the PPM agreements that we can write second loans and junior loans and things like that, but we haven't done any of that today. And are you guys fund the construction draws as well, or it's more just lend out a certain amount up front and then that's that's that yeah we do both so we'll put down money to go acquire the property and then put it on a construction draw schedule that was really interesting i think too oh, uh, one thing i wanted to ask you about was i, I know you had talked about living in an an intentional life i think you want to talk about that for for a minute um sure so i'm writing a book right now that should be released next year hopefully hardest process in the world i don't know if you've gone through <laughs> it yet but uh uh, we can no. chat offline on that. But it's really, when I say ROI in the finance space, people think return on investment. One of the things that I got in this space for was this idea of return on intentionality. Because I had two events that happened earlier in my life where my sister was had Down syndrome and she tragically passed overnight in an instant. And people always say like, you need to understand that life is finite and live for the moment and those sorts of things. And it doesn't really click to you until someone close to you dies with no warning in your parents' house and, and things like that. Unfortunately, my after she had passed, we were kind of going through the grieving stages as a family. And then six months later, my dad had to have triple bypass surgery. So we had really two back-to-back -back events in our family that really put time in perspective. And I know you have a little one. I have kids five and seven, and there's only so much time that you're going to get to spend with them. So ultimately, my goal on this world is to help people live an intentional life, whether that's being more present with their family, whether that's pursuing the passions they care about. In order to do that, you have to solve the money problem. And so you might as well get your money working for you harder than you do for it so that you can go be intentional in the areas of life that you want to. So that's kind of my spiel on that, I guess. Yeah, I think, no, that's a great message. Let's go out on that, Matt. So yeah, how do people get in touch with you? They want to find out more about what you're doing or maybe invest with you. What should they do? Sure. So two places. One, I have a podcast as well, which your host was a gracious guest on in the past called Ice Cream with Investors. I'm just a fat man trapped in a skinny man's body who loves ice cream. And uh, we uh, talk about all different sources of niches in the real estate market. So you can find Ice Cream with Investors on all your favorite podcasting apps. Uh, and then last is you can go to our website, nextlevelincome.com. There's a button in the top right corner that says invest. If you click that, that'll link directly to my calendar and would love to chat with anybody who's interested in investing or is just new to their investment journey and wants to learn more about kind of real estate investing as a whole. Awesome. Appreciate it, Matt. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. If you learned something from today's show, leave a review and hit that subscribe button wherever you enjoy your podcast. Dive deeper into real estate investing on Brenneman Capital's website, Brenneman.com, where we have numerous free resources and information that can help both active and passive real estate investors. Accredited investors can get started today as a passive investor in our multifamily investment opportunities by hitting the Invest Now button on our website. 
The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of Drew Brenneman and guests as of the date of recording and do not purport to reflect the views or opinions of Brenneman Capital LLC and its subsidiaries. Views and opinions are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon or deemed as investment or tax advice or an offer to buy or sell securities. The speaker cannot be held responsible for any direct or incidental loss incurred by applying any of the information offered.